Morning, Mountain View. Good to see that you all survived those extreme winter elements of South Orange County on your way in. You chuckle, but uh, I was just in Tennessee last week, and it got down to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Let me just tell you, I am not built for that kind of weather. I've gotten soft since we've been here in Orange County, Uh, but glad to see you. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, The Washington Post launched a social experiment to answer the question, can people recognize greatness? Can people recognize the, the art and the beauty of greatness all around us? And to do this, they approached arguably the world's current best violinist of our time, Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell was a child prodigy. At the age of four, his parents say that he was stringing rubber bands across the hallways of his home from doorknob to doorknob just to make music uh, in his home. And so his family bought him a violin. And by the time he turned 12 years old, Joshua Bell played in his very first symphony. By the time he was 30, he was selling out auditoriums to come and listen to him play for tickets no less than $100 a piece. Uh, As Joshua Bell sold tickets to these concerts, he would, on average, make about $1,000 a minute. Uh, But Joshua Bell didn't play for this social experiment, did not play in royal concert halls. No, he played in the L'Enfant subway station of the Washington, D.C. Metro subway. He came down dressed in a ball cap, a t-shirt, and blue jeans and pulled out his three and a half million dollar violin, the Stradivarius violin, and began to play uh, what musicians argue is one of the most difficult musical pieces in history by Johann Sebastian Bach called Shakoni. Playing on the world's most expensive instrument, the world's most talented violinist, set up in the government district of Washington, D.C. and began to play. He played the exact same concert the night before in Boston to a sold-out auditorium, making $1,000 a minute. But it took, in this moment, four minutes for anyone to even glance his way. It took seven minutes for someone to stop and drop a little bit of money. Thankfully, it wasn't just pocket change. This person dropped a $1 bill. After 45 minutes of playing, Joshua Bell made a total of $32.17. Of the thousands of people who walked by and passed by in this moment in this subway station, only seven people paused for more than 30 seconds. Of those seven people who paused, one person paused for 10 minutes, dropped a $20 bill in his case, and said, I just saw you last night. What are you doing here? But yet thousands upon thousands of people walked by and did not even notice the greatness that was in front of them. My fear is this Christmas, the same can happen to you and I. Uh, We we can be so accustomed to the the narrative and the story of Christmas. We can be so used to filling our schedules and getting into this rhythm of a Christmas calendar that we're in a different event, in a different place, and just the busyness and the hustle and the bustle of the season that we can miss the entire point and the entire purpose of Christmas. Because aren't we already so busy Aren't we already so full? Aren't, aren't we already kind of feeling the, the chaos of the season? And for so many of us, we can be so over-familiar with the content of Christmas, even as Christians, that we miss the whole point. That's why I love the Advent season. That's why I love this, this moment in our calendar every single year where we can just simply pause right in the busyness of the season and we can just take a moment to breathe and remember the reason for this whole season. 
where we can just pause and relax and begin to anticipate and start to see what this season is all about and begin to rediscover the wonder of Jesus so that we don't miss the whole point of the season. So as we kick off this Advent season uh, this year, uh, I, I want us to just start by recognizing, acknowledging, celebrating the reason for the season that, that we talk about often, but uh, we want to summarize it this morning for you, that the gift of Christmas is, spoiler alert, Jesus. The gift of the season, the gift of Christmas is Christ. Now, Christmas time is a time that we get and give gifts. Uh, it's a unique time of gift giving because there are other seasons, there are other moments, there are other times where we give gifts. We give gifts for birthdays, we give gifts for uh, wedding showers or baby showers. There are other times that we give gifts, but Christmas is unique in that time that everyone gets a gift. And this Christmas season, the gift of Christmas is Jesus. And so out throughout this season, we're going to take some time to drag our feet through this old prophecy in the book of Isaiah. So I'm going to take you back to a, a Middle Eastern culture 700 years before Jesus was born. There was this man named Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet, someone who spoke on behalf of God to the people of God with a message from God himself. Uh, this prophet Isaiah uh, delivered this promise this prediction, this prophecy from God himself to the people of God. And this is what the prophet says in Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 2. Isaiah 9 verse 2 says this, The people who walked in darkness had seen a great light. Does anybody want to see a great light this Christmas? Is anybody desperate for, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of despair, and in the midst of all of the difficulties that we're walking through right now, is anybody desperate for some light this Christmas? The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelled in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, which is good news for us today because that means that the government of our world, the government of our community is not on our shoulders. It's not on the shoulders of the leaders. In fact, it is on the shoulders of our heavenly father. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of the hosts will do this. And that now, did you notice that Jesus didn't just show up on the scene? He didn't just come and, and arrive and show up and say, hey, guys, I'm here. Everything's going to be fine now. Did you notice that Isaiah uses very specific terminology that the Messiah, the promised one, was given? This is terminology that we find all throughout Scripture. In fact, if you go over to John chapter 3, this may be a text that you're familiar with, but over in John chapter 3, the Gospel of John, when Jesus was here, when Jesus was doing ministry, even in John, we see this terminology of given. It says in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave. Uh, this, again, is that terminology that shows us that the Messiah, the promised one, the chosen one, the one who is sent to redeem and rescue was given. But why start all this gift-giving business? Uh, why start all of this whole idea of giving gifts? Well, John shows us that, uh, that gifts were given because God loves the world. And so he gives the gift, this central gift of Christmas but we might miss it. 
Uh, we, we may miss it because we could so easily make something else central this Christmas. We could miss it because something else makes itself central this Christmas. We all come into the Christmas season with different expectations. Uh, we, we approach this time, this, this part in the calendar where, uh, where we show up around a holiday season. We bring different expectations into this moment. Uh, expectations of the gifts that we're hoping for. Uh, expectations of the gifts that we're hoping to be able to give. Uh, expectations that there will be peace all around us. In the, great, in the words of the great philosopher Clark Griswold, we expect that this season is a season and a moment of resolving our differences and seeing through the petty problems of family life. And yet, in the midst of this season, with our great expectations of peace and great expectations of everyone getting along and everything just being smooth, we are hit with the reality. It seems like every season that uh, life here on earth isn't as easy as we had hoped or expected or wanted or wished or maybe even wished upon a star at Christmas. And what's interesting here is we look into Isaiah Chapter 9, as we read this, we've got to know that the gift was coming. Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one, the, the one who was prophesied about, wasn't coming in to a perfect environment with perfect people, with everyone smiling in the perfect moment for the perfect Christmas card photo. No, Jesus arrived. God's gift came right in the middle of the mess of the world. So can I just encourage you? If you find yourself this Christmas season discouraged, if you're feeling defeated, if you're feeling maybe a bit depressed, if it feels like the darkness will never lift, maybe this Christmas, the best gift that you can get is not the perfect circumstances in your life. Maybe the greatest gift that you need this Christmas is a perfect savior who has come right in the middle of your circumstances to become and to be everything you've ever needed in life. We look for our, our satisfaction. We look for uh, this, these perfect scenarios and circumstances in so many different ways in, in, in our stuff, in our possessions, in, in, what we can, uh, in what we can get in our life. We look for it in, in the positions that we hold in our career and the achievements that we can accomplish educationally or professionally. We, we look for this satisfaction. We look for this, this joy in so many different ways. But maybe it's not looking internally for you that distracts from what's central this Christmas. Maybe it's what's happening all around you. Maybe it's what's going on in the world around us right now. War and Terrorism and difficulty and death and uh, famine and uh, different circumstances that are much different than anybody would have ever wanted in life. And I could go on and on and list all of the different things, the, the, the chaos and the crisis and the, the hunger and the abuse and the abandonment and everything going on in our world today. And yet, I find it incredibly comforting 700 years before Jesus even showed up on earth, he showed up and was given not into perfect circumstances, not into sterile and sanitized, clean spaces where everything was just right, which reminds you and me this Christmas season. It reminds us that Christmas is that moment where Jesus comes into our present realities, problems and all. Uh, all you have to do is to look back to the very first Christmas. This was a Christmas where there was no room for Jesus in the end. Uh, this was a Christmas where uh, there was no space for Jesus among the perfect places. There was no room for Jesus with the people who had it all together and the people who could manage everything on their own. And maybe you're here today and, and you've tried to convince yourself over and over again that you can just manage on your own. You can just figure things out on your own. Don't bother anyone. And yet I want to remind you this morning as we kick off Advent that Jesus is a gift at Christmas that has been given to you. 
But Jesus didn't come into this world empty-handed. But he also didn't come into this world to fix all of the problems in the world around us. We tend to kind of fixate on these problems, don't we? We fixate on, ah, we, we, we got to... We gotta fix everything going on in the world. And, and don't get me wrong, we ought to be a force for good in the world around us. But we fix on, fixate on that, thinking that if Jesus would just show up and fix all of the problems around us, this world and this life would be a whole lot easier. Think about it like this. Uh, you, you drink water often from a bottle, and uh, what's inside this water bottle? This, is not, this isn't a trick question. And I know some of you may think I'm a monster, but there's, what's inside this water bottle? Water, right? Uh, now, if I were to open this water bottle and shake this water bottle, what would come out of this? Uh, good, you're tracking, right? It, water comes out of this because water is inside this. And so if I were to shake this water bottle, what comes out is water because it's already inside the bottle. The difficulty is, in our life, we, we all experience in different ways a, a bit of shaken up. We all experience moments and days where we feel like we're shaken up by the culture around us, by the world, by circumstances, by broken relationships, by difficulties in our life. And uh, the, the difficulty comes is we want, the, we want the world to stop shaking all around us. We want the problems to just go away. Gosh, if, God, if you would just fix everything and stop all of the shaking in our life, things would be a whole lot better. Now, to be fair, this is what the people even in Jesus' day wanted. They wanted Jesus to show up and stop all of the problems and fix all of the, the, the moments where they're feeling shaken up in the world. You can just look at the story of where Jesus fed the 5,000. Incredible, miraculous moment. Everybody's hungry. Nobody came prepared. Lunchables hadn't entered the scene yet. And so there's a problem. Well, Jesus shows up and feeds them, and everybody loves it. There's something special about this guy. And this is the story that we know and the story that we love. But if you read to the end of the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, it didn't even take till the end of the story where the people who were in and who were bought in and who were ready to follow Jesus were already out. Because, yeah, Jesus fed them, but he didn't fix the world around them. Which is what we oftentimes want. If Jesus would fix the problems in our world, this would be a whole lot easier. But in fact, Jesus says we've, uh, we've missed it. Because all of the shaking in the world just reveals that the problem lies within us. You see, the, the shaking that we've experienced in life, for all of us, every single one of us, we're shaken in some way, and it just reveals that there's a problem that lies within us. In this season, we've been shaken all over. And what's coming out of us is fear. Uh, what's coming out is we're terrified, but Christmas reminds us that we're not alone. Maybe what's coming out in your life is, is anger. And in this moment when you're shaken, you just get angry, and there are two things that could happen in our anger. Uh, sometimes God says, you know what, I'm angry about that in the world too. Uh, I'm, I'm frustrated that that's happening in the world too, and in that moment we're just reminded that we're not alone in our and our anger. There are other times when we're shaken in our world and anger comes out that the Lord leans in and in that moment speaks to us that, that the anger that's coming out is exposed. Maybe what's coming out in, in your life is grief or guilt. And this is where the message of Christmas speaks to us that, yes, Jesus is the gift of Christmas. But Jesus did not show up at Christmas empty-handed. No, in fact, Jesus brings the gift of grace. And this gift of grace that Jesus comes with isn't to just fix all the problems all around us. No, Jesus came to see us in here. We get so exhausted by this posture of always looking out there for Jesus to fix everything else and the problems of everyone else around us. 
to be honest, that's a safer posture. It's, it's a whole lot easier. It's more comfortable for us because if we're always looking at the problems out there, we don't have to deal with any of the problems in here in our own life. But what Jesus wants to do is to transform us from the inside out so that we respond to these problems differently, so that these problems in our life get to meet Jesus face to face. We, listen, we talk at length in Christian, American Christian cultures, we talk at length about keeping Christ in Christmas. But how about we start living and working to keep Christ in Christians? Advent is this season that, that we get to pause and refocus our energies and create margin and space for the life of Christ to dwell in and flow through us. And yet, we see it time and time again, one of the great Christian contradictions, one of the fundamental contradictions of Christian spirituality, at least in the United States, is our deep desire to have Christianity pervade our culture but not have Christ permeate our being. But y'all, we need both. Yes, we need Jesus to infiltrate the streets of our community. Yes, we need Jesus to change the landscape of our culture and our city and the world around us. But it starts with Jesus invading our own life and our own heart. We cannot lead anyone where we have not been ourselves. And so if we want to see Jesus shape the culture, we've got to beg and ask Jesus to shape our own heart and our own life first. And Christ is not kept in us when we try to keep up with the pace of culture. Living without any margin or uh, without any time for reflection and prayer. Christ is not kept in us when we adopt this consumer-driven mentality that bases our identity on the accumulation of stuff and the accumulation of wealth. Christ is not kept in us when we settle for some superficial definition of happiness and disregard the joy that comes only from God himself. Christ is not kept in us when we spend all our energy worrying about our cultural power and influence, but friends, Christmas is a reminder that it does not have to be this way. Every Advent season, we're invited to a mutual indwelling with God. We're invited to root our lives in Christ and allow Christ to be rooted in us. Back in Isaiah 9, the prophet says this in verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. This is a simple fact that Jesus is given that shows us that the presence of God in Christ is a sheer and complete act of grace. Wages are earned If you work a job, you earn a wage. Now, imagine for a moment that you worked for me. I know, dream job. But imagine for a moment that you worked for me and you put in an entire week's worth of work and you showed up to my office at the end of the week and I said, hey, I've got a little gift for you. Here's your paycheck. You'd be like, Brandon, that's not a gift at all. I worked for that. I earned that. No, a gift is something that is given. And church, hear me loud and clear that Jesus is a gift. Grace is a gift. For to us a son is born and to us a son is given. We were gifted grace. Not because you've earned it. If you think that Jesus coming at Christmas was because of all the potential that you had stored up, you're confused. If you felt like Jesus came at Christmas because of the good that you would become, you've missed the story of Christmas. Because in Christ, you're fully forgiven. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Do you live like that? That in Christ, you're fully forgiven and fully free? Tim Keller, the late pastor of a church in New York City, said it this way, the the way to receive this gift is to refuse to rely on your own efforts anymore. Lay them down. Don't rely any longer on your performance, but thankfully and radically rest completely in the grace that comes to us through Jesus. 
Jesus brings this gift of grace. And the way that he does it is not just by the life that he started at Christmas, but by his death and resurrection as well. Today, he invites us to put our faith and trust, not in our own ability, but in trusting that that's why he came to us. But his gift of grace isn't just some spiritual saying. It isn't just something where Jesus shows up and say, hey, here's the grace, you go figure out the rest. No, Jesus comes not empty-handed, but full of everything that we need. Isaiah captures it this way. It says, for to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. I just love this, that the message that the Messiah is bringing at Christmas time isn't a message that says, hey, just read your Bible. Hey, just show up to church more. Hey, just pray a little bit more. No, the message is not that the Messiah comes in and says, do more stuff, earn it, fix it, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. No, that's not the message at all. The message is this world feels shaky. This world is broken. Life is hard. Cancer is terrible. Abuse is wrong. And in the midst of that, the difference with Christmas is this. God, our wonderful counselor, wants to look at what's coming out with us and walk with us through it. And God gives us the wisdom, the the counsel of what he would do. So this Christmas, if you're carrying guilt, what what would God say to that? He would lead that guilt to the cross and show you and tell you that your guilt is canceled and finished there. If you're carrying anger this Christmas, what would the wonderful counselor lean in to tell us in this moment? It could be that he would show you that he's angry about it too. It could be that in your anger, God might show you that he wants to transition that anger into this radical thing called enemy love that he talks about so often. When Jesus comes, he brings the gift of grace And he brings the gift of himself, Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus is our wonderful counselor. So that we don't have to walk through this season on our own. Whatever you're you're going through, we have one who's counseling us named Jesus. But what's more, we have someone who understands what we're walking through. You ever felt betrayed in your life? Yeah, Jesus has too. You ever felt like your friends have fallen asleep on you in your most needy time in life? Yeah, Jesus has too. We talk about a lot here at Mountain View that we are home for the wanderer. We're rest for the weary, for the restoration of all things, which means that this is a place where you can show up, uh, not, uh, not showing up in a, prescribed way, but showing up in the way that you are, knowing that you'll be accepted and you'll have a place to belong wherever you're at and wherever you've been. And oftentimes, in the Christian circles, what we want to do in this moment is well-intended. We, we want to throw someone who's struggling a rope. We want to toss them something that will help to get them out of whatever they're walking through and going through and We'll, we'll say, hey, you can do this. Come on, you, you need some help up. Come on, grab the rope. We will help you up. We'll often throw some spiritual ropes out. We'll say, hey, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You can do this. You've got this. Or, or we'll take out the rope of, uh, for God works all things together for the good. And so whatever you're going through, yeah, we'll help you up. But just know God's doing good things through it. And those things are true, and those things are good, and those things are gospel ropes that we toss out. But the difference between followers of Jesus and the rest of the world is we're not just throwing ropes saying, hey, figure this out, let's, let's fix this. No, we're not just throwing ropes saying, hey, let's, let's get you out of this. We're, as followers of Jesus, we're jumping into the pit. We're jumping into the hole with you. That's why we're the home for the wanderer, the rest for the weary for the restoration of all things because we're jumping in it in the mess and the pain and the difficulty and the 
distress. We're jumping in it with you. To which the person in the pit may say, whoa, what are you, what are you doing? Now we're both down here. But it's the moment that we get to say, no, yeah, I'm in this with you. I'm here not just for you, but I'm here in the moment with you. And I'm going to help to lead you and walk with you in this pain and in this difficulty. And let me just reassure you that I've been there before. That's the story of Christmas. That right in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the mess, and in the midst of the brokenness, unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And Jesus got right in the middle of the dirt to understand what it is that we go through. The trials that we face, the darkness that surrounds, and everything that shakes us. And in the midst of that, Jesus says to us, follow me. I know the way out. And the way out is following Jesus wherever he leads. And the best part of the journey is that Jesus is with us, our wonderful counselor, side by side, talking with us step by step. So you're really not alone in your parenting. You're really not alone in the struggles of your marriage. You're not alone in the struggles of your finances or your job or your health. You're really not alone in the mess and the confusion and the chaos of the world. Don't take my word for it. Take his. That is the good news of Christmas, that you can take Jesus up on his offer, that he'll really walk through life with you, and that he knows what we're walking through. Many scholars have made the parallel between the seasons of life and the seasons of the soul. Uh, there's the season of fall, a season of a whole lot of change. The, the weather changes. The weather moves from hot and humid to very cool, and all the leaves on the trees are changing, and everything in the fall season is all changing all around us, everywhere except California, but stick with me for the purpose of this illustration. Everything is changing all around us, and I know if you're in that season of change in your own life, in your own heart, what I want you to hear this morning is that we have a wonderful counselor who is in every season. And it might feel like things are moving so fast in this season of your soul. But God is in it. And he has something for you in every season. There's a season of winter, a season that can be dark, a season that can be cold, a season that can feel isolating and lonely. And you may today be in this season of the soul where you just feel all alone. And I realize it can be so tempting to hide, to just stay alone when you feel alone. But can I encourage you? Can I ask you? Can I challenge you? Can I just beg you to keep showing up? We need you. Even if it feels dark, even if it feels cold, and lonely, just keep showing up. There's a season of spring, a season that brings new life, a season that brings sunlight, uh, a season that brings change, often good, but it can oftentimes feel terrifying because you're used to the old. But can I tell you this morning, our God is a God who does new things. We don't just have the old things to look back at. We don't just have old stories of faith where God moved in incredible ways. No, we have a God who does new things. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a God who does new things and somebody needs the new things this morning in your life. <laughs> seasons of summer, seasons of rest, seasons of family, friends, fun, and laughter, seasons that we're reminded of the goodness of God and the grace in our life. Whatever season you're in, I want you to know that you're not gonna be in that season forever. It may be good, but there's something difficult coming. It may be hard right now, but there is good that God is brewing and starting and creating in your life because our God makes all things new. This Christmas, 
May you be encouraged. May you be reminded. May you take hold of the simple truth of God, Emmanuel, God with us as our wonderful counselor, walking through every single season that we're in. Let's pray. Father, you, you're good. You're with us, you're for us. And God, in this season of Christmas, where we're busy, where our schedules are full, where our calendars and our weeks are cram-packed, may we pause to remember that you're with us, that you've given us your wisdom and your counsel. And God, may we lead whatever we're walking through, may we lead that to the gospel that changes everything. Thank you for Christmas. And thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Oftentimes at Christmas, we get into the traditions, the things that we always do. We always put up our tree. We always put up a real tree. We always hang Christmas lights on the house. And in the tradition of Christmas, it can become mundane. But I love that that our Heavenly Father has given us Christmas that comes once a year as a reminder of Emmanuel, that God is with us, not distant from us, not absent from the realities of our life, uh, not far away and, and keeping his distance so that he can be safe from the mess of our life. No, Christmas is God with us. And so this morning, as we receive communion, May we pause to remember that this simple act of worship of communion is a reminder of the presence of God today, right now, and every day with us.